So when you grab your Bibles and want to turn and read it up on the wall, we're looking at Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. I entitled this morning's message, Humble or Exalted? Humble or Exalted? It's a very familiar passage, but we'll look at it again. And Jesus, speaking, said, He told this parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax gatherer. And the Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. The question facing every person is how can we be reconciled to God? In every man-made religion, philosophy, and worldview attempts to answer that question. But in the final end, there are only two possibilities. One is either make ourselves right before God, or number two, we can't. Those are the choices. And every religion, except for divine accomplishment from God's word, is based on human achievement. Being morally good. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, being morally good according to human standards, and those standards keep changing year after year after year, don't they? But the standard that God demands is perfection. Perfection. Jesus commanded in Matthew 5, 48, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And if that wasn't hard enough to try to fulfill and to live out, he goes on to teach in Matthew 5, 21, 47, it expands it to even including your thoughts and what's in our hearts. That is enacted on you. But what you think about and what you feel inside. So when the disciples asked the question, who can be saved, Jesus? Who can be saved? And Jesus answered it in Matthew 19, 25 and 26, where he said, with people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. God can do anything consistent with his nature. He never goes against his word. So how can a person be reconciled to God? How can a sinner be acceptable to a holy and just God? That's the key to this parable that Jesus is teaching here. That's what he's thinking about. That's what he's wanting to address. Because we are utterly incapable of justifying ourselves before God. I don't care how good you are. According to the scripture, you can't do it on your own. The Old Testament, the New Testament teaches that justification is solely by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And in Him, He removes our sins. He covers us with this robe of righteousness. Where do I get that? In Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God, for He hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with garland, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. God covers us. He protects us. 
He gets rid of what we are and covers us with his robe of righteousness. Philippians 3, 9, Paul taught that not far from the law, but righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. It comes from our faith in him. Now, how is that possible? By Christ's death on the cross. And he sacrificed himself. We just come around his table of remembrance, thanking him for that. He paid our debt, sin's debt, for all time, forever. So our faith totally rests in him. The Jews of Jesus' day lost sight of the Old Testament teaching. And they replaced it with their own legalistic system of salvation by works and rituals and ceremonies and outward ceremonies. So Jesus, again, presents us the correct answer to the question of how people can be justified for, by a holy God. And Jesus' parable, as he shared this, goes against everything the Jewish people believed at this time. Everything they regarded as salvation. That's why this Pharisee could do what he did and say what he said. And he tells us with two, a story of two people, doesn't he? One is this self-righteous, outwardly religious Pharisee. And the other is a sinner, a tax gatherer, a tax collector, a despised traitor of the Jewish people. Nobody in a Jewish mind would think of taxing themselves and then following Rome's commands to do what they did. But obviously this individual thought this was the only job he could get. I don't know. He did it. He wasn't proud of it, obviously. In fact, he's ashamed of it. And as the tax gatherer is justified or made righteous at the end of this parable that Jesus taught. Look again at verse 9. And as he also told this parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. The Lord addresses to certain ones, and your scripture may have a different translation here, some people. But the point is, these are people not of the faith, certain ones who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous, and viewed others with contempt. And the word that's used there in the Greek means worthless, despised people. This is a description of Saul. Saul of Tarsus, before he became Paul. This is a description of him. He fits that perfectly. But he was saved by grace through faith in Jesus. Remember? On the Damascus Road, God got his attention. He blinded him. 1,500 years later from this, Martin Luther came to the same conclusion as the Apostle Paul. We can't do it by our works. We can't do it. We need Jesus. Entrance into God's kingdom cannot be gained by human achievement, even though we try. Excuse me. But it's only by the merciful, gracious, and loving Heavenly Father. In 10 through 13 here, here's this contrast. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, a gatherer. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not like other people. And then he gives his list, swindlers, the unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer over here. And he brags on himself, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I can get. But the tax gatherer, two different people here, the Pharisee and the tax gatherer. Two polar opposites of people, mindsets, and everything. One is the most pious, the most religious, the most respected. And the other is the one most people can't stand to even be around. Impious, impious, despised. So different. It's night and day. And notice their posture in this. The Pharisee stood, which was acceptable to pray that way. In the direction, what is he focusing on? The scripture says on himself. Praying thus to himself. God. And you could just almost picture him. I think some of the old Bibles that had pictures of these kinds of images. That here's this guy out here standing up facing the Lord and yelling to the Lord. And I'm not like these other people. Thank you. 
It's all about himself. It's all about making a good showing, isn't it? This ostentious display was self-promoting. He patted himself on the back for what he was doing. He fasted twice a week. The law was once. He paid tithes of all that he gets, so he's going beyond what's required. He thinks he's got it made. And then he makes this list out loud of all these people that he's not like. He's better than. I didn't see any hypocrites in there in that list, did you? Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax gatherer. It's all about himself. And that's why Jesus tells it that way. Praying thus to himself, about himself. Then, in verse 13, but, there's a but there, a condition. The tax gatherer standing some distance away. was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven. But was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Standing some distance away. He wasn't trying to draw attention to himself like the Pharisee was. He wasn't lifting his eyes to heaven. He was overwhelmed with his unworthiness. His shame. He knew what he was doing and he knew it was wrong. And he's beating his breast there. Notice that. Why is he doing that? He's showing his extreme sorrow and guilt and remorse for his sin. He's showing that. And then he speaks, God be merciful to me, the sinner. He's asking for mercy, isn't he? Did you see that in the Pharisee? Not a thing about mercy. He admits he's a sinner. There's nothing about that in the Pharisee's prayer either. And then he's repenting for himself to me, the sinner. Not a sinner. Look at that. My translation says the sinner. He's pointing the finger at himself over and over again. Then Jesus gives his listeners his answer. Verse 14a, he says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. This man, rather than the other, the Pharisee, justified. That statement very likely shocked the legalists in the audience. The Greek word that's used there for our English word justified means having been permanently justified. Not only is his sins forgiven, he's forgiven for all time, permanently. And notice that Jesus didn't appeal to the rabbinical authority of the day. He said, I tell you. I tell you. He's asserting his absolute <laughs> divine authority on this situation, in this parable. Without any public works, law-keeping or moral achievement, spiritual accomplishment, following rituals or ceremonies judicially, this guilty sinner was by Jesus... In this parable, declared righteous permanent. <clears throat> and since the righteousness God demands can't be earned by human effort, God gives his righteousness <clears throat> to this repentant sinner. He put his trust in him. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now granted, Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. But the salvation of this tax gatherer was pre-Christ, pre-cross conversion <coughs> in this parable. And then Jesus concludes the last part of verse 14 for everyone, everyone, everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Solid truth. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble. Exalts himself. Self-exaltation ends <coughs> with judgment. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. And the word that's used here, humbles himself, is in the present participle tense, which just means that it's a continuous, repeated action. He just didn't do it one time. He continues to live the rest of his life that way and humbling himself before God. That word there, humbled, in the Greek means crushed. For everyone that exalts himself will be crushed. 
Everyone who exalts himself will be humiliated, eternally lost. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, punished. God is opposed to the proud, James said, James 4, 6. But he gives grace to the humble. He does not approve. He gives grace to the humble. God is opposed. He doesn't say it's okay this time. He is opposed to that. And that's what Jesus is making so clear in this parable. When you exalt yourself and you think, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it, he's saying, no, you haven't. God shows mercy and compassion and forgiveness to those who humble themselves. That's right now. when they really confess that they can't do it. You've been there. I've been there. You can't do it. And they admit that they can't do it. They can't do it on their own. They can't be perfect. The self-righteous believe eternal life is earned. The saved know it's a free gift. The self-righteous believe they will be commended by God when they get there. The saved seek his forgiveness. The proud legalists believe the kingdom of God is for those who are worthy by their definition. The saved know the kingdom of God is for those who are unworthy. And they're trusting him for that salvation. So how do we put this in our minds and our heart today, this text? How do we get it around us? How do we think about it? Never played football before. We didn't have it when I was in Waynetown. But I read about it and listened to sports people. In football, they tell the offensive line, no matter how big you are, guys, stay low. No matter how big you are, stay low. No matter what your name is or your title is, stay low on that offensive line. No matter how much money you make, no matter how many people you know, you stay low on that offensive line. Because there you're going to have leverage. And you're going to be able to do what you need to do. Stay low. In every church today that's going on, I hear that 400 and some churches close every day. In America. There are those in that, those churches who are there for the right reason. And there are those in the churches who are there for the wrong reasons. Just like Cain and Abel. They were both chosen, used by God. They both brought their offerings to the same altar. One was accepted, one wasn't. Why? The one had his agenda. What about you and me? When you and I pray personally, nobody else around, listen to yourself. Who do you, who do I, who do we sound like? The humble tax collector or the pious Pharisee? In this parable that Jesus told, both of them were heard. They both told the truth, but only one had his heart and his mind on God of all creation. God knows our hearts. We can never fool him. Have faith in Jesus Christ. Stay low. Stay humble. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, please forgive us for our times of self-righteousness and pride. Cleanse us of our thoughts and selfishness, our desires for greed, our times of doubting, times where we've forgotten your grace and your mercy. I think we deserve something even more, something Speak to our hearts today as you did to those hearing this parable 
for the very first time. <clears throat> and move each of us in our own way as you determined before we were even born to walk with you, to speak on your behalf, to show your love and mercy and kindness to others, to be true followers inside this building and outside this building, in this place of worship. <clears throat> I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, if you've never...